Now, at this time, we begin Lesson 9 in our series of lessons on the book of Job. And we've learned a great truth in the book of Job that has been hidden up to this time. We've learned from Job chapter 27, verse 5 and 6, what Job's real problem was. And Job's real problem was he was trusting in his own righteousness to justify him before God. Now, these matters don't come out until God crosses our paths. As Sam Jones said, a cross is where your will runs this way, horizontally, and God's will runs that way, vertically, and they cross. Now, it's true there is no New Testament salvation per se, doctrinally, found in the book of Job, but the pointers that point to it are tremendous. Nowhere in the world does our will come up against God's will any stronger than when God does something we don't approve of, like allowing terminal cancer to take the life of a loved one, or like allowing a patient to be bedridden for 25 years. There's no telling how many practical atheists came back from Korea and Vietnam because what they saw over there, they were convinced there was any God up there at all. He didn't know what he was doing. That's the problem. The problem is man figures God doesn't know what he's doing, so man will take it in his own hands and do a better job than God did. Now, basically, that's what goes on in the mind of every unsaved, educated man anywhere in the world. The modern educator is busy trying to bring in the kingdom and bring in peace and earth, goodwill to men, or peace and prosperity, as he calls it, by doing what he figures God was either unable to do, or what God couldn't do since God wasn't there, or that which God refused to do and left man to work out for himself. Thus, the base problem of every unsaved man is exactly the same. He's a do-gooder trying to justify himself. Now, this is especially true of communists. Communists and socialists are what we call do-gooders. They're goody-woody, good deed for today, little boy scouts. And even where they reject God, Christ, and the Bible, they are continually devoted to, to uh, the proposition of trying to do good to their fellow man in order to justify themselves. Now, it's true these poor, sick, mentally upset people, mentally disturbed people, don't realize their motive for do, doing good. But the fact remains is man is incurably religious, and that's their religion. You're these loud mouth braggadocia people blowing and sputtering and spouting and blowing off steam about bringing in the kingdom and bringing in peace on earth and bringing in the ultimate society and ending man's inhumanity to man, the summit conference for the unilateral disarmament of the blah, 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 blah. Uh, these people are trying to prove their sincerity to their fellow man by doing good. They are the do-gooders, and their religion is justifying themselves by helping out their fellow man. They're religious but lost. Now, Job's case is the Lord has crossed his will. God has given Job a bitter dose to take, and he's drinking the dregs of a very bitter cup, and he doesn't like it. So he's finding fault with God. Now, who can blame Job? Perhaps if you were put in Job's shoes, you'd find fault with God too. But the fact of the matter remains this, Job is deeply uh, embittered about the way God has treated him. Now, if there's any doubt about that in your mind, read chapter 31 carefully. Chapter 31 is 40 verses of a man's attempt to justify himself. And I must confess, after having read Job 31 79 times, that Job was probably one of the most righteous men that ever lived, if not the most righteous. He had no worldliness, 31.24. He was not guilty of idolatry, 31.26. He didn't ever curse. Job 31, 30. He never stole anything. Job 31, 39. He was never wasteful. Job 39, 31, 38. He never took vengeance on an enemy. Job 31, verse 29. He was never stingy. Job 31, verse 32. He was never deceitful. Job 31, 34. And he never compromised. Job 31, verse 35. Now, did you know I've said quite a mouthful in the last 30 seconds? Here's a man whose righteousness extended far beyond the Ten Commandments. Here's a man whose righteousness was not only outward, but inward. It wasn't simply a matter of no overt act of sin, like committing idolatry or cursing or stealing. The man wasn't worldly, he wasn't stingy, he wasn't deceitful, he didn't compromise, and he didn't even waste the soil that God gave him to grow crops on. 
I believe if you had reduced the righteous men in the Bible to about three men, you'd come up with the judgment that God came up when he spoke to Ezekiel and said, I wouldn't spare that land, though Job, Noah, and Daniel were in that land. And if it came to a choice between Job, Noah, and Daniel, I'd put my money on Job. But he was trusting his own righteousness. And that's what the Lord had to show him, and God had to take that from him. So he graduated from Ash Heap University, exactly as David graduated from Combat College, and Jonah gradu graduated from the Mediterranean Bible Institute. And the Lord put him through the Ash Heap curriculum, and when he came out, he came out purified. He starts with the parable in chapter 28. On it goes. Deep material. I couldn't profess to understand most of it. Job chapter 29, on he goes, describing his condition of exaltation when he was somebody, when people honored him, when he had what he wanted, was respected and revered by the community. Then in chapter 30, he described his terrific fall and the consequent treatment that the people gave him. Again, we find a description of a man in hell in Job chapter 30, verse 29, 30, and 31. We have descriptions here which in some vague, obscure way, which I don't fully understand, refer to the condition of Satan before his fall and his condition after the tribulation. Then we go on in chapter 31, and in Job chapter 31, we have Job's great justification of himself. This is great tirade against God and against his companions, and it is the self-righteous man declaring his righteousness. Notice the first person singular. Verse 5, if I, verse 6, let me, verse 7, if my, verse 8, let me, verse 9, if mine, verse 10, let my, verse 13, if I, verse 16, if I, verse 18, from my, verse 19, if I, verse 21, if I, verse 24, if I, verse 25, if I, verse 26, if I. Verse 33, if I, 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 me, 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 me. Years ago, before the start of World War II, before Germany invaded Poland, Franklin Delano Roosevelt got on the radio and spoke for about 30 minutes about world conditions, and he was followed by Adolf Hitler. Somebody counted the number of times the word I or me occurred in those two speeches, Adolf speaking for 30 minutes and FDR speaking for 30 minutes, Adolf made a reference to himself something like 30 times in the speech, which is about one time per minute, and Roosevelt made reference to himself 78 times. He outdid the dictator better than two to one. Job says, I, 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 and then he starts his justification. And no man who read Job 31 and believe it, no man who read it, could go out from reading it and say that Job was unrighteous. The man was more righteous than the Pharisee, he was as righteous as Paul. I spoke with John Wesley, one of the few men who ever lived who were truly holy. But his besetting sin was he knew it. When you get to be proud of your humility, you're no longer humble. Chapter 31, 1. He didn't commit adultery with a look. How's that? Isn't that a good bit better than some of you have done? of whom the Bible says in the last days they'll have eyes full of adultery. He didn't step out in his wife or mess up another man's wife, verse 7 to 10. Isn't that a good bit better than some of you have managed? I don't know why people turn up the nose to the Word of God. Job was a righteous man. The book began by saying, A perfect and upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Look at verse 13 and 14. Do you think he was a a capitalistic bourgeoisie that persecuted his maids and his servants, not him. That fellow took care of widows, verse 16 and 17, and the fatherless. That fellow was a benefactor, a humanitarian. In verse 19, he took care of the care packages himself. In verse 20 and 21 and 22, he refused to take somebody aside against a poor man in a dispute. He wasn't covetous. Verse 24, he didn't make Riches his ambition, although he was one of the wealthiest men of all the East. He knew better than to go after money. He knew that the love of money was the root of all evil. So he avoided that sin. 
Isn't that a great deal more than you can say for some of you Christian people I'm talking to right now? Here is a man with no Bible, no indwelling Holy Spirit, no finished blood atonement, and here he is, better than 98% of the Christians in the body of Christ in the 20th century. He wasn't an idolater, verse 25, 26, and 27. If that weren't enough in verse 29, he didn't even rejoice when judgment caught up with his enemy. Now, isn't that something? That's inner righteousness. That's going far beyond the law. That's almost a fulfillment of the New Testament commandment that says we know we have the petition we ask of him because we keep his commandments and, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. He took care of the strangers, 31, 32, and 33. He confessed his sins to the Lord, verse 33, and didn't hide them. And in verse 34, Job makes a remarkable profession. He says, when an issue came up in my town, do you think because all the kinfolk and the majority got together on one side that I kept my mouth shut and went not out at the door? Job said, do you think of all the people in the neighborhood were for, for pornography? Do you think that I kept my mouth shut if I was against it? He stood up against it. He was a Protestant. He protested. No matter what the majority said, did I fear a great multitude, or did the contempt of families terrify me that I kept silence and went not out at the door? Isn't that something? There's a man whose righteousness went far beyond the Ten Commandments, brother. When a controversy came up in a local issue, a political issue, and a local issue in the community, that old boy stood up and said, I'm against it. And what his kinfolk thought about it didn't amount to a hill of beans. And if he went down there in the town council meeting and all the councilors got up and said, we ought to put this new tax on the people and decide to renovate the downtown district, get the money back down here so we can blow it because it's going to go to crumb anyway, but to keep the place looking good so we can run, come down here and go with some nice offices, old Joe would get up and say, I'm against wasting the taxpayers' money. Somebody say, shut up, you fool. Don't you know all the people for it? He said, I don't care what the people for it. Not I'm against it. That's the kind of man Joe was. Ah, oh, dear friend, I bet he had more integrity than some of you got. If the majority of scholars said the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscript the most authoritative, and all the great scholars making in Warfield and Kenneth Weist and Zodiades, and all the majority of conservative scholars always agreed this is the best position, if that fellow didn't believe it, he said, did I keep my mouth shut? You think a multitude or contempt of families keep my mouth shut? I went out the door and said, you're wrong. That's Job. Verse 35, O that one would hear me, behold, my desire is the Almighty would answer me, and that mine adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me, like a man coming into court, you know, with a brief, and the case all written out. I would declare unto him the number of my steps. As a prince, I would go near to him, because he's just guessing. When the Lord finally shows up, he doesn't go to the Lord as a prince. He falls down on his face like a beggar. But that's how it always goes. When a man has a head-on collision with the Lord Jesus Christ, it always turns out a lot differently than you think it's going to. You've got some dumb nuts in this country who think if Jesus Christ came in the house, they'd sit down at the table and talk with him over the table. You'd fall flat in your face. You've got people in this country who think if Jesus Christ came in the house, he'd have Kagawa on his left side and Muhammad Gandhi on his right and Buddha and Leo say and Mel say coming along behind him and throw you some kisses with a Jewish constitution given before the crucifixion. We've got people in this country who don't have a sense that God gave a brass monkey. If Jesus Christ came in your house, you'd be flat in your face. And when the Lord finally shows up and gives Job a chance to declare himself, do you think Job goes like a prince near him? Job says, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. In his final justification, Job says, If my land cry against me, or the furrows likewise thereof complain, if I have eaten the fruits thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, let thistles grow instead of wheat, and cockle instead of barley, the words of Job are ended. <laughs> Down he sits. Now, you know what that man said? That man said, I've treated my dirt right. I haven't overworked my land. I haven't bled the vitamins out of it. I haven't put artificial fertilizer on it. I haven't plowed the thing without fertilizing with animals while it was being plowed. My land can't cry against me, and the furrows can't complain. 
Now, did you know that man was at least twice as righteous as your father? Or anybody you know? But he wasn't right with God. The book of Job, therefore, teaches us one of the most horrendous lessons in the Word of God, one of the most terrific lessons in life. It teaches us the terrible and awful truth that every man at his best state is altogether vanity, and by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, and if a man is saved by grace through faith, he's had it. And Job goes on and says, I didn't let anybody pick any of my crops without paying them. You didn't have to have Chavez come around and organize his pickers. He paid the pickers. Verse 39. And he said, I kept my land so no fellow could go through there and sue me for liability, for not keeping the property up. Job certainly has a lot to brag about. But the Bible says, By grace you say through faith, not, not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works, not of works, lest any man should boast. And Job has been boasting. Chapter 32, verse 1. So these three men ceased to answer Job. Why? Because he was righteous in his own eyes. And the end of verse 2, because he justified himself rather than God. Now that's the description of the Pharisee in the New Testament. That's the description of the people of whom Christ said, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So although Job is a perfect and upright man, he has an inner problem which nobody knew about except the Lord and the devil. And Job is in the sieve, he's been sifted, he's been weighed in the balances, and here he's found wanting. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite, of the kindred of Ram, against Job with his wrath kindled, because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer, and yet had condemned Job. Which is true. But no use putting the fellow down if you can't offer him a solution. I mean, if it's just a matter of punishment, that's up to the government, and God had already punished him. This peculiar idea that punishment with no remedy is wrong for the state is a false doctrine, too. That's a sick mental teaching. The reason why a killer should be killed is so he won't kill somebody else. That's why 75% of the people who go back into jail for killing or stealing are second and third time offenders because the law was not executed. But it's a matter of personal dealing. When you tell a fellow he's wrong personally, tell him how to get right. And if you can't, shut up. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. And when Elihu saw there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite, answered and said, I am young. And ye are very old, wherefore I was afraid, and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, Days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. Which is so. I mean, the longer a man lives, the more he should learn. A man learns by experience. That's why nearly always you find older men are conservative. The older you get, the more conservative you get, because the older you get, the more you find out what will work and what won't work. When you're young, those high school and college teachers will con convince you you can break any law and get away with it. But boy, by the time you're 40, you see the income and returns coming in, and you suddenly realize it's not quite as lawless as it looked. But there is spirit in a man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. Which is true. Great men are not always wise. Some of the biggest fools in the world have reputation for being great men. And often you can find blue blood or pure blood in the blood of a fool and the blood of a mosquito. Great men are not always wise. Neither the aged understand judgment. 
There'd be too many cases to list. The bibliography be too strong. You have great men like Napoleon before the Battle of Waterloo saying, I make circumstances, and then lost his shirt. You have men like Hooker before the Battle of Fredericksburg saying, I've got Lee in my hand now, and not even God could deliver him out of my hand, and lost his shirt. Great men are not always wise. You have a president talking about government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth, while he instituted compulsory drafting and compulsory income taxes. Great men are not always wise. Sometimes they're out and out liars. Neither the aged understand judgment, not always. Sometimes the older fellow gets, the dumber he gets. Therefore I said, hearken to me, and I will show you mine opinion. Behold, I waited for your words. I gave ear to your reasons. Will she search out what to say? Yea, I attended to you, and behold, there was none of you that convinced Job or that answered his words. Now here in verse 15 to 17, we have the author of the book clearly revealed. If you will pick up any commentary on the book of Job, you will find none of the commentators ever found the author of the book of Job, because they altered the King James text. The text of it stands, verse 15, says, They, third person, were amazed. They, third person, answered no more. They, third person, left off speaking. When I had waited, first person, for they, third person, spake not, but stood still and answered no more, I said, quote, this shows you the writer of the book is writing in the first person, Job 32, verse 15 to 17, which means the author of the book of Job is Elihu, the son of Barakal the Buzite of the kindred of Ram, who is contemporaneous with Job, and who is sitting on the ground with him, talking with him. This clearly identifies the author of the book of Job, which none of the commentators could find. One must remember that the King James text is always superior to any Hebrew or Greek text, or any commentary by any commentator, alive or dead. Elihu is plainly the author. So you will find verse 15 to 18 changed in every new version of the Bible recommended by anybody to cover up the ignorance of the revision committees. Par for the course. 33.1. Wherefore, Job, I pray thee, hear my speeches, and hearken to all my words. Behold, now I have opened my mouth, my tongue hath spoken in my mouth. My words shall be of the uprightness of my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. The Spirit of God hath made me, the breath of the Almighty hath given me life, and if thou canst answer me, set thy words in order before me. Stand up. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed of the clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. Surely thou hast spoken in mine hearing, and I have heard the voice of thy word, saying, I am clean, without transgression. I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. Citing chapter 10, verse 7. And then he goes on. Now what has Elihu said? Elihu said, Job, you've been hollering for a chance to speak up to God, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to play God for you for a while, and I'm going to stand here in God's place and try to answer as God would have me answer. And he's saying, Job, you've been sitting there in the ash heap and hollering about getting your chance to get a day in court and needing a daysman. Now you can stand up and talk to me, because I'm made of clay just like you are. All flesh is grass. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. I'm not going to scare you. I'm not going to persecute you. And you talk to me and answer me, and I'll try to give you what God has for you. And now Elihu starts. Elihu's speech runs through Job chapter 32 and 33 and 34 and 35 and 36 and 37. It is the longest speech in the entire book of Job. It runs across there from chapter 32 through chapter 37, where Elihu is magnifying God and magnifying the glory of God and driving home one thought to Job, which is true, which, by the way, Job knows. But he asked to have it reinforced and hear it from somebody's mouth beside his own. And this thought that Elihu keeps driving home and driving home and driving home is simply this, that no matter what God does, he will not sin. That God will do right whether we believe it or not, whether we think so or not, whether we can comprehend it or understand it or not, God will not do wrong. That's Elihu's theme. Notice, for example, Job 34, verse 10. Therefore hearken unto me, ye men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, 
and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. For the work of a man shall he render unto him, and cause every man to find according to his ways. Yea, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. Verse 17, Shall even he that hateth right govern, and wilt thou condemn him that is most just? Verse 23, For he will not lay upon man more than right, that he should enter into judgment with God. Verse 29, When he giveth quietness, who then can make trouble? And when he hideth his face, who then can behold him, whether it be done against a nation or against a man only? Verse 33, Should it be according to thy mind, he will recompense it, whether thou refuse, whether thou choose, and not I. Therefore speak what thou knowest. Let men of understanding tell me, and let a wise man hearken to me. Job hath spoken without knowledge, and his words were without wisdom. My desire is that Job may be tried to the end because of his answer for wicked men, for he addeth rebellion unto his sin. He clappeth his hands among us and multiplies his words against God. Strong charge, strong accusation, and coming out of the mouth of Elihu, who didn't have a headache at the time, and probably had his bills paid and hadn't buried any children, it seemed rather unfitting. But it was true. God won't lay upon a man more than that is right. The Lord will give you what you have coming to you. And when God gives quietness, who can make trouble? Nobody. The Bible speaks about the peace of God that passeth all understanding, keeping your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon me. When he giveth quietness, verse 29, who then can make trouble? Nobody. There have been people who have been submitted to torture and subjected to torture in the jails of the Spanish Inquisition, and martyrs tortured and burned at the stake, and roasted and grilled and fried alive, who had more quietness and more peace than Nero had in the palace the night that Rome burned. And when he hideth his face, like he hated against Israel in this dispensation, who then can behold him? Nobody. Whether it be done against a nation, there is Israel in this present dispensation, or against a man only, like Herod. When Herod called Jesus Christ in there, he asked him questions for 30 minutes and never got one answer. And when God refuses to reveal himself, nobody can find him. And when God reveals himself by the written word and the word of God, and you reject that written word of God, you can't find God if you look through nature the rest of your life. And the biggest fool in this world is a deist who believes in God, the devils also believe and tremble, and thinks he can find God in nature when God chose to reveal himself in a book. And where a man rejects that book, he can't find God. Who then can behold him, whether it be done against a nation or against a man only? Now we'll talk further about Elihu's speech in our next lesson in the book of Job, which will be lesson number 10, and continue to search out Elihu's great justification of God, and Elihu's great speech in defense of God Almighty, and his magnification of the only true righteousness that can save a man, the righteousness of God Almighty. We come now to lesson 10 in our studies in the book of Job, and here we're well along through the book. Job has ceased complaining and shut his mouth after chapter 31, and there's nothing more to say. And in chapter 31, he has justified himself completely, at least in his own eyes, and he's gone through a number of verses here describing his righteousness, and all of what he says is true. And the Bible said he was a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and astute evil. The Bible wasn't speaking facetiously. Uh, Job lived up to his reputation. His character and his reputation matched. Yet after 40 verses in chapter 31 of justifying himself, Elihu has one more shot to put in before the book is over. And Elihu's point is this. His point is, Job, you may be right, but you're not as right as God. You may be right, but you can't complain about God getting with you because God is always right. We're not always right. And Elihu's point is, my brothers here, the three comforters, have not found out what your sin is, they haven't proved anything wrong on you. They've condemned you and put you down without adequate proof. And uh, they're just as bad a shape as you're in because although they've condemned you, they haven't given you any solution to the problem. They haven't answered your question that had to do with your predicament. So Elihu was undertake to be a spokesman for God and speaking up in God instead to Job. He is driving home with force, and he drives it home many times, the great truth that no matter how terrible 
uh, circumstances seem to be, and no matter how horrible the circumstances we have to live in, God is not going to make any mistakes. One might say that a lie who has a grasp of Romans 8.28 before it's written. Although, of course, as we've mentioned before, it is one thing to be sitting there in good health with your bills paid and your family all alive and talk about all things working together for good. And it's quite another thing to be sitting in an ash heap after having buried ten children and a cantankerous wife down your neck and uh, your body aching from head to foot and being unable to sleep and dying slowly from a disease. It's something else in those uh, circumstances, under those circumstances, in that condition, to be talking about we know that our present light affliction, which is but for a moment, and so forth and so on. But Elihu is telling the truth. And the truth of the matter he speaks about is that God does right no matter what. And, of course, this is all very true. Uh, he says about uh, Job in Job's case in chapter 34, 10, Far be it from the Almighty that he should do wickedly. And again, Elihu says in chapter 35, Thinkest thou this to be right? that thou saidest, My righteousness is more than God's, which although he had not said verbatim, he had strongly implied it in chapter 27, verse 6, and chapter 9, verse 30 and 31. For thou saidest, What advantage will it be unto thee, and what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? I will answer thee, and thy companions with thee. Look unto the heavens, and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than thou. If thou sinnest, what doest thou against him? Well, we realize sin is against God, but practically speaking, what damage have you done to God by your sin? I mean, isn't the truth the matter? The damage you've done, you've done to yourself. For if thy transgression be multiplied, what doest thou unto him? And if thou be righteous, what givest thou him? What receivest he of thine hand? Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the Son of Man. In plain words, Although the Bible tells us to be right, tells us not to sin, when push comes to shove, what does sin do except destroy ourselves? It isn't going to destroy God. Our sins were paid for at Calvary. In that sense, we can say our sins caused the death of God's Son, but that's over with and done. What will you do now? You'll hurt yourself. And if you were righteous, that's good for you, and the Lord will bless you for it. But what does that do for God? Does that give God something he didn't have? I mean, God was righteous to start with. He gave you life and breath and fresh air and food and clothing. What do you give back to him? Paul speaks of these things in the New Testament and puts it before the Roman congregation when he says that since there are all things that are of him and by him, who can give back to him? In Romans chapter 11, Paul says in verse 35, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Is there any man I'm talking to that ever gave God something before God gave to him? Where is such a man? The fact that you're breathing shows that God had to give you life and breath. There is no way in the world any man could give God anything first, because God first has to grant him life before he's capable of giving. Then Elihu says in verse 10, But none saith, Where is God my Maker, who giveth songs in the night? Well, that's a little bit tough on Job. Job been saying it for a good while. Where is God? He'd been trying to find God. So when he says, But none saith, Where is God my Maker? He's putting it on a little bit too thick, a little overstatement. However, he concludes with, Who giveth songs in the night? Now, here's a terrible implication that Job should be singing and praising God in his trouble. Well, perhaps he should. Paul's in jail, and he sings praise to God at midnight with Silas. And I read my Bible right before the bloody crucifixion, the terrible agony in Gethsemane, that they went to the Mount of Olives, and before they went to the Mount of Olives, the Bible says they sang a hymn. Did you notice that in Matthew chapter 26? On the way out there, when he went out there, that terrible, bloody betrayal, they sang a hymn before they went out there. Now, isn't that something? Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, they went out there and sang a hymn before they went out. Matthew 26, verse 30. The problem is the songs in the night, if you know what I mean. And the sun is brightly shining, and the hills are covered with 
beautiful flowers, and even the weeds of the field are dressed like the daughters of God, and the spring is coming on, and all the flowers and things are bursting out like harmless bombshells, and the trees are putting on their boots of sod, and the air is filled with a buzz and whirl and song and chirp of birds in the spring, and some lark becomes unbottled with ecstasy and blows out that shrill bass across the meadows. It's easy to sing. All nature is singing. The problem is those songs in the night. Like in the battlefield of Shiloh in 1862, where 20,000 young men were wounded and dying, the ambulances came out to pick them up at night. There were men out there in the battlefield bleeding and dying by the hundreds, and some Christian out there who nearly had about 30 or 40 minutes to live began to sing, There is a land of pure delight, where with never, with ever blooming flowers, and death like a sullen stream divide that land from ours. And after about 15 minutes, there were 8,000 voices floating up in that battlefield where young men were dying under the starlight. Songs in the night. Songs in the night. It's one thing to sing up on a platform, you know, you got a shirt on and a coat on and dressed up in the latest fashion, the latest haberdashery, and have a congregation of a thousand people to sing to and sing the song of the Zion with electronic equipment. And it's nothing to lie flat in your back in the hospital dying of Bright's disease or Hodgkin's disease or leukemia and sing there. Songs in the night. David said he put a new song in my heart. On goes Elihu, chapter 36, verse 2. Suffer me a little. Put up with it. Do you know sometimes you suffer when you put up with folks? That's where the expression comes from. There's nothing archaic about it. Suffer me a little, and I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar, and will ascribe righteousness to my Maker. That's Elihu's main theme. And he keeps driving it home, and driving it home, and driving it home. That God is righteous, God is righteous, God is righteous. 26. Behold, God is great, and we know him not, neither can the number of his years be searched out. And very true. And he tells Job in verse 18, Because there is wrath, beware, lest he take thee away with his stroke. And that's why it's called a stroke to this day. And a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Then he goes on and describes God's marvelous power as manifest in the works of nature. And in chapter 37, he talks about God's remarkable power in the balancing of the clouds, in the rain, in the coming of the spring, in the coming of the winter and God's dealing in nature. We'll talk about these things more in much more detail uh, when we begin to talk about the scientific data found in the book of Job, which shows up in the next chapter, chapter 38. And Eli winds up his speech by saying in verse 23, Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and plenty of justice. He will not afflict, that is, he won't afflict without cause, there won't be a reason. It's true we read in the, word, in the Word of God, the book of Job, that the Lord said to Satan, you move me against him to destroy him without a cause, but the Lord blessed him, and the Lord had a cause in doing it, as is manifest by the end of the book. Men do therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. Very true. Very true. We now come to Job chapter 38. Now the remarkable thing about Job 38 is that the Christian Research Foundation, established by Harry Rimmer many years ago, set up a standing award of $1,000, which is still good, to anybody who could find a scientific error anywhere in the Word of God. You hear very often about the Scopes trial, the monkey trial, in Dayton, Tennessee, where Clarence Darrow made a fool out of William Jennings Bryant, because although William Jennings Bryant was a silver-tongued orator and a great politician, he certainly wasn't much of a Bible student, let alone a Bible scholar. However, you never hear very much about the famous trial that took place with James Bennett as the attorney for the defense in New York when the Bible was taken to court uh, five times on counts of scientific error and successfully defended, and the plaintiff's case was thrown out of court. You don't read much about that, do you? Have you ever noticed how peculiarly the Associated Press and the United uh, Press handle the news services? Did you ever notice that? Did you ever notice how the peculiar slant they put on the news? While they never refer to North Ireland as Ulster, although that's the name of it, 
how they never refer to the Irish Republican Army as the Army of the Roman Catholic Church, although every member of it is a Roman Catholic. Did you ever notice that? Did you ever notice how when they report the news, they never report the fact that when they passed gun registration laws in North Island, got all the weapons, all the weapons were handled illegally by the Catholics in the South? Did you ever notice how hard it is to get an unbiased news report? It's amazing, isn't it? So you hear often about the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee, but never hear about the five times the Bible was taken to court in New York where James Bennett defended it and the plaintiff could not collect a dime. Now, one time Harry Renner was in a hotel during a convention of scientists, and he offered a, a standing award to the scientists present if they could answer the questions asked in the book of Job in chapter 38. There are 35 questions asked in this chapter. The 35 questions that God asked Job. And remember, bet these scientists a certain amount of money, that is not as a bet, but as a standing offer to anybody who could do it, that not a single one of them could ask, answer the questions that God asked Job 1,800 years before Jesus Christ was born. With a possible high scoring, I think, in the questions of a possibility of about uh, 350 points on 35 questions, with a possibility of 350 points, the high scoring man got less than 200 points. That is, the scientific material found in the Bible is always ahead of any scientist who ever lived. We read in the Bible that a man is not to speak with a stiff neck in Psalm 75.5. Voice teachers had quite a time learning that verse. We read in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, that a man is to wash his hands over running water. Surgeons didn't learn that verse until 1880, after they lost a half million patients through gangrene where the wound was reinfected after the operation. We read in our Bible that a man is known by his hand, implying every man has fingerprints, and back here in the book of Job a little bit earlier, we read in chapter 25 that the moon doesn't shine. In Job 25, 5, we read, Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. Now, everybody thought the moon shone until long after the time of uh, Christ. And yet somebody, 1800 B.C., knew the moon didn't shine. It was a light reflector. 25.5. That is not all. Whoever wrote the book of Luke knew the earth was round, for he spoke about it being daytime and nighttime at the same time. Isn't it amazing how far ahead the Bible is of any scientist anywhere, any time, under any condition, in any age? It's downright fantastic, isn't it? I mean, after all, you're dealing with the God of the Bible, you're dealing with the God of nature. And if God could make an ear that can pick up vibrations under 16 per second and over 38,000 per second vibrations, you're dealing with a God who knows what he's doing. And that's the God who wrote this book. Now, here the question to start. The questions being asked are being asked by the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of Genesis 1 and 2, the Creator, the Almighty, and the one who could make the sting of a wasp smooth, without one irregularity or roughness in it, while man cannot make the finest steel needle known to man under a microscope look like anything but a rusty poker. He starts the questioning. Chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. As we pointed out before, this plainly uh, dumbrates the second coming of Jesus Christ, and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. That's what Job had asked for. He'd asked for a chance to defend himself. Now he's going to get it. Question number one. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. No answer. When this infant world was wrapped in swaddling clothes of light and serenaded at the start, there isn't a man I'm talking to right now that could tell you where he was. There isn't a scientist that ever written a scientific book, textbook on the science of origins. 
The only scientific textbook in the world that's available on origins is Genesis chapter 1. And there is one scientist living or dead I'm talking to right now, or talking to later, or would have talked to if you'd stayed alive, that could produce one textbook written by any scientist that offered any proof of where anybody was before Genesis 1-1. The Lord knows and you don't. And there wasn't one scientist at the meeting with Higher Rimmer who could answer the question. Second question. Who laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Next question. Who stretched the line upon it? Somebody said, well, there was no line stretched upon it. How to get measured then? It has measurements. Somebody said the measurements were accidental. Well, that's nonsense. You get figure on the size of the earth, the weight of the earth, and the uh, tilt of the earth, and this and that, get studying those matters, and it's distant from the sun, and it's distant from the moon, which we'll study in just a while, and you realize none of it could have been accidental. Next question. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? Anybody ever found out uh, where the ocean bed stopped and where they joined the magma or where they joined the igneous rock? Does anybody know for sure what's straight under your feet? 20,000 miles? Or better still, 2,000 miles? You say the scientists say, they say a lot of things. They say Ipana brings a brighter smile. So what? Science proved that suspenders will keep your pants up. And I believe scientists have proved there's no Santa Claus in the North Pole. But outside of that, what did they ever really prove that you couldn't have proved anyway? Verse 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. What well, these dumb scientists of 1970 don't even know the sons of God were present before Genesis 1. As a matter of fact, the Schofield Board of Editors didn't know it. They make the sons of God the sons of Seth in Genesis chapter 6. Why, well, these sons of God are here before Genesis 1. Question. Who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it issued out of the womb? Somebody said, well, the sea began by, you can't prove it. Somebody said, well, back there when it was slung off as a molten mass from the soil, you can't prove that. Isn't it amazing how dumb a fellow gets going to college, coming out and saying, well, all this stuff and all this stuff, you couldn't prove it if your life depended upon it. If you had the entire works of the American Association of the Advancement of Science available, there would be one scientist or 40 of them combined that could prove the ocean came from a cooling off earth if your life depended upon it. And you know it and I know it. If you don't believe it, try it in court. Verse 9, when I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and the thick darkness, a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. What keeps the earth from overturning the land? You say gravity. What's gravity? Who are you trying to kid? <laughs> What's gravity? Explain it. And on go the questions. Now, I'm not going to go into detail throughout all these questions under such a brief study as this, but these questions are amazing when one considers the scientific data that man had to accumulate before he could answer half of them. For example, in verse 16, you are told there are freshwater springs in the bottom of the ocean. Nobody believed that till after the time of Christopher Columbus. In verse 16, nobody walked in search of the depth of the ocean at the time of Bibi's bath sphere. And even the people who did this knew nothing about the gates of death, verse 17, and none of them had been through death and come back to talk about it. And here's the breadth of the earth mentioned, verse 18. They didn't know the breadth of the earth till after 1500. Where is the way where light dwelleth, verse 19. Notice he didn't say where is the place. He said where is the way. Because light has no source except in God. It's always moving. It's always traveling. It had no place, but only a way. Then we read, Have you entered the treasures of the snow? Verse 22. And somebody insisted there was no such thing as treasures in the snow and treasures in the hail, but that the expression was figurative, and the doctor shoot proved there was $8.14 worth of fertilizer and per acre and nitrate, ammonia, and albuminoid in a snowfall of one inch over an acre of ground. Now on and on it goes. By what way is the light parted? 24. Well, by the spectroscope, by the prism of the spectroscope, but nobody knew that for years. These are questions that a scientist has been working on for two and three and four thousand years, 
and the Lord who spoke to Job knew the questions before these fellows knew the answers. And on they go. And of course, some of the questions are absolutely impossible to answer. For example, verse 34. You can throw ice pellets in the air and fly around the airplane and sing to the crops out in California and have a rain dance to your red, white, and blue in the face, but you can't make it rain when you want it to rain. If you don't believe it, ask the folks out in California and Kansas. Out in Kansas during the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, when Roosevelt was president, they found a sign stuck in the ground out there, about two feet high in the dust by an abandoned, deserted farmhouse, and the sign said, You gave us beer... Now give us water. Well, the great white father in Washington can give you beer and whiskey, but he can't give you water. He can raise the price of milk, but he won't raise the price of whiskey and beer. Those are considered to be essential. <laughs> Job chapter 38, 35, Canst thou send lightning that they may go and say to thee, Here we are? Now who could have guessed what was found in that verse? When that telephone was invented by the use of electricity, those lightnings were harnessed, and when you pick up that telephone, somebody says, are you there? We're here. Here we are. Somebody harnessed the lightning. But it sure took them a long time, didn't it? You must confess the Bible is always at least 5,000 years ahead of anybody with any kind of brains. And on the question goes. He asked Job's questions about the skies. Verse 37, who can number the clouds in wisdom? There isn't a meteorologist anywhere in the United States who could even guess what the number is. To number the clouds that are across this earth, you'd have to have 150,000 meteorologists with 150,000 radar systems all reporting simultaneously at one time as far as the sets could reach. You couldn't do it. You couldn't do it in 1977. And then he goes on. Who can answer verse 39? Who can answer verse 41? There's no answer to verse 41. If you got up to tomorrow morning and knew you had 2 million insects to feed and 4 million birds and 150 million wild animals, what would you do for gathering their food? You couldn't gather it. And on the question go. Now this points out the great God of nature, the God of the Bible. And this God of nature and this God of the Bible are the same God. He's one God. And this God of nature and God of the Bible has available in nature for man to see phenomena which should make any man at least into a deist. That is, at least into a man that believed in God if he believed in nothing else. And yet, strange enough, there are many people upon the earth that profess to be atheists. I suppose they do this to get attention more than anything else. I'm sure that's why Engels and Karl Marx did it. But we study the phenomena found in nature, we're left with the indelible impression that such a thing as instinct does not exist. What is called instinct can only best be described as imparted wisdom. And it is now time for us to take out from our study of the book of Job, the verses that they stand, and deal for a while with what we call the phenomena of nature, which point, out, which point out the great God of the Bible, the great God of the book of Job, the Lord God Almighty, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now these things here are apropos to our study because in Job chapter 40 and Job chapter 39 and Job 38 and Job 41, the Lord is pointing out these things. And he's pointing out to Job the fact that anybody powerful enough to do in nature what God does has a right to do what he pleases, which he certainly will do. So for a brief time, we're going to talk about the God of nature and God revealed in nature, and there are remarkable phenomena on every hand which show that God is God and that Darwin, according to his profession, was probably kin to a monkey. Now, as to where to begin these studies, a little bit hard to start, but we'll start at uh, as likely a place we can start at. And we'll talk first of all about the so-called evidences for organic evolution and then show why these things are pure unadulterated nonsense. The evidences so-called for organic evolution are one, vestigial structures, which are supposed to number about 180, which are supposed to be structures in man which he no longer uses, which he was supposed to have inherited from animals. Not a single one of these structures has ever been proved to be absolutely useless 
Therefore, the guess that they are vestigial is a bum guess which couldn't hold up in court. Comparative anatomy is given as a proof of evolution, the fact that skeletons look alike. This is much as saying that the chair I'm sitting on evolved from the table I'm reading at because they have four legs. The fact that two things look alike is no proof of their evolution at all. It's only a proof of the fact they were worked on by inventors. The idea of saying that a Volkswagen evolved from a Cadillac. Who are you trying to kid? Now, the people who tried to kid people into believing this were people like Lyles, who wrote the book on geology, and Darwin, who both wrote the book on uh, the survival of the fittest, James Hutton, George Cavier, the father of vertebrae paleontology, Lamarck, William Strater Smith, the father of English geology, and James Hall and Edward Coop, and other writers in America. They presented biochemistry as a proof of evolution, that is, comparative physiology, the fact that the blood precipitation tests showed that man might have been kin to an animal. Unfortunately, the closest kin was the tiger, and next the whale, and next the pig, a rather dubious strain of evolution. Embryology then produced a proof of evolution, the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, the idea that the embryo goes to the stages of the race, and then taxonomy, the classification where animals are grouped into groups that are supposed to indicate evolution, which is pure guesswork, and finally geographic distribution. These are the arguments presented for evolution and, re- and debunked and reneged by the Word of God and abrogated by the Word of God, and we'll talk about this more in our next lesson on Job, which will be lesson number 11.